Welcome to the Revolution Roundtable, a discussion of life, faith, and scripture. We are people just like you, living real, often messy lives, and we're committed to helping each other live a little bit more like Jesus every day. Let's join the Roundtable now. Oh, hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Roundtable. Uh, we are in the second of three episodes that are uh, specifically talking about our emotions. Uh, last episode, we talked about the emotion of anger and how we can do a better job of processing through emotions, how we can uh, stop our emotions from kind of driving the car of our life. And uh, so I've got my friends here with me. Uh, my wife, Katie Scott, uh, leader of our speaking team here at Revolution and author of ChasingVibrance.com. Uh, Miss Kate Petit, who uh, is a TRE specialist, and we talked about that some in our last episode, but someone who has done a lot of studying into how the brain works, how our body uh, reacts to emotions, how our body contributes to our emotions, um, as well as a, a teacher in our local schools for uh, 20 years. And then my good buddy, Matt, our connections pastor here at Revolution. And as I always say, resident, awesome guy. Thanks for being here, guys. So um, so I, I want to dive into, uh, in, the, in the last episode, we talked about anger and how anger can uh, make us deaf, how our body can trigger anger um, with some different things, um, and how anger isn't a negative, but it can become a negative if kind of left unchecked, if left unprocessed. And so uh, in this episode, we want to look at some specific ways we can um, go back to that response moment and... um, control what's happening a little bit better. So before we dive into that, I think it's important for us to realize what's what's happening in our brain. So Kate, you uh, you, you were telling me about this this hand brain model that just helps us kind of understand actually what's happening. Can you can you go through that? Absolutely. So the hand brain model is a model by Dr. Dan Siegel and uh, he has it on YouTube. He explains it and so I'm just going to take a minute to real quick explain what that yeah. is. Um, so <clears throat> the hand brain model is your thumb kind of wraps in like this. And this is your amygdala. Your amygdala is your emotional response trigger. And then your fingers wrap over the top. And this right here is your prefrontal cortex. So this prefrontal cortex is where we do all of our thinking, all of our problem solving. This part of our hand right here is called our brain stem. And when we have emergencies or we get angry or really emotional, we flip down here to our brainstem in our fight, flight, or freeze mode. And then the rest of this is what we call the backbone or your spine, where all of your nerves run. So this is all really interconnected. And so <clears throat> what we have is when we start to get angry, when we start to get irritable, or when we start to get upset, what happens is your amygdala starts to rock a little bit. And what I mean by that is You can feel emotion in your body. So you can tell when you're starting to get irritated with people. You almost like immediately clench. Like if you're an anger person, like you start to get angry and you start to clench in your body. So um, one is when that starts to rock, you have to become aware of those things. Because when you know those are starting to rock, it's a good time to say, you know, I'm feeling really irritated by what you're saying. And so sometimes that can kind of preempt an argument or a fight. Um, It can also, with kids, kind of preempt some of the big reactions that they're having. And so what happens is when you have that big reaction, your amygdala flips out and you are now offline to your thinking brain. It's completely flipped and it's flipped you down here to your fight, flight, or freeze. And so um, when we are in that, fighting can be... uh, um, you know, an angry type of fight. It can also be in emergency situations like firefighters, policemen. It can be like running toward the danger. That's also um, a fight mechanism. Um, You have freezers. And sometimes, you know, those people who just shut down, they stop talking, they're frozen. Crying, that's a frozen response because you're just overwhelmed and you don't know how to deal with it. Um, And then fleeing can be, um, you know, people who run away and get help from emergencies. Like, that's great. They're the first people to be making the phone call to 911, right? They didn't run to help the bleeding, but they they went to get help. Um, 
So that's really important to know that people have that. Um, sometimes people feel like when they freeze, it's a bad thing. This has been called your reptilian brain. This God put here for your protection. Yeah. You flip here for a reason. And so emotions are not a bad thing. They just need to be watched. Mm -hmm. And so um, all of this is just connected to your spinal cord because that's going to make your body go into... Um, whichever those reactions you're going to do. And so the thing with this hand brain model is that it was really great when I used it in my classroom and when I use it at my house, because what I can say is, Ooh, I can tell math is really rocking your amygdala right now, right? You are frustrated because you are like slapping your hands on your paper and you're like flipping your, your you're knocking your pencil on your desk a lot. And so I can tell right now we're not going to be able to do this math. So here's what I need you to do. You know, take out your crayon, color the top half of your paper for the moment, relax, let me go help somebody else. And then I'm going to give you a little bit and then come back. Or um, I had one student during math, uh, she really flipped her lid. <laughs> she sat over, I was doing some math centers, and we heard everything fly off her desk, right? It was like, <laughs> and it went, gone. <laughs> it went, it went, it flipped, hit the board, everything. And I just go, whoa, you totally flipped your lid. And everybody just started shaking their head. And I was like, it's okay. I get it. But what we need to do now is come back into our prefrontal cortex. I need you to walk down, use the restroom, get a drink, and come back. Yeah. Mm. And so after she did that, she had walked out of the room and I had some kids like go to pick up the mess. And I was like, no, we also need to learn the consequences of flipping our lid. Mm -hmm. And so what we did after that is when she came back in the room, I was like, I just need you to take a minute and kind of pick up the mess that was made. It's okay. And just constantly reminding it's okay because, you know, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's very difficult when somebody does not react loudly to your reactions. And we know that our kids try to get our attention sometimes by being very loud. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but so she picked up her stuff and I just said, hey, when you're ready for my help, you come sit by me at the round table and then we'll start, we'll start working on this problem. And it worked perfectly. And so my kids, it was funny because one day this little girl came up and she's like, Miss Patty, I think your amygdala is rocking. And I was like, you know what? It absolutely it is. is. <laughs> I've asked you three, I've asked wow. the class three times to pick their stuff up and get to their desk. And there's two people at their desk. It is absolutely rocking. And you know what? They were in their desk in no time flat. <laughs> Nobody wants to see, see right? you flip Nobody your lid. Nobody wants funny. to flip their lid, but we're only human. And it just became a talking point. And, yeah. and my kids could internalize it. And yep. so it's one thing that um, we had definitely, I learned this in the neuroscience course. And um, so it's one thing that is definitely helpful for parents to start working with kids and for kids to regulate their parents. You know, I taught this at a family uh, night at Fairview when we had one of our uh, sessions. And it was so funny when we called the parents out. I was like, guys, do your parents ever get real loud? And they were just like, yes, mine, mine, mine. And the parents were all kind of sheepish. But you know what? It's, uh, yeah. it's one of those things. You know what, parents, we do. And we yeah. don't want our kids to do it. And our kids don't want us to do it. So when it does happen, you simply say, I'm sorry, I flipped my lid. Yeah. So when you can take it and put a name to it, if you can name it, you can tame it. Yeah, absolutely. I, and so, some, someone told me once, uh, or I read it, I don't remember where, this is embarrassing, but the, the greatest enemy to a healthy life is ignorance. Mm -hmm. When you just have the knowledge of being able to put a name to something, right. yeah. you know, then you can start working through it. Yeah, but absolutely. If, you, if, if you're never, if you don't open your mind to what it could be mm -hmm. and it's just some crazy unknown force or whatever, then, then you're never going to be able to control it. So, right. I think that you mentioned that verse in James, that's talking about that quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. I think sometimes that piece of listening is listening to us to internally taking sure. that space where you're going like, Oh, I see now. Yes. My amygdala is rocking. Like I am, I'm feeling this tension in my shoulders and like my jaw is clenched and to listen to what's going on in us so that we can be like, okay, now I'm in this space and now I'm going to start putting into like my breathing or my practices, or I'm going to take a break from these kids because I'm feeling triggered. I have small children. So that's why I'm saying kids or yeah. this coworker, or whatever it <laughs> right. is, whoever, your, whatever your situation is, yeah. um, and create that space that we've talked about that we're going to frame in the hope and the gospel and the truth and then move forward with yeah. a reaction. 
Yeah. So it's so good. So with my son's <clears throat> autism umbrella, he was he was first diagnosed extremely ADHD and oppositional defiant. Mm. And so as a parent, you know, when you ask them to do something, you can only stay calm for so long. But like right. that oppositional defiant, sometimes he's like right up in your face and, you know, you want to react, react. back. But I just like, hey, you know what? My amygdala is rocking. It really is. And I need to go take some time before we deal with this. Yeah. And normally by the time I would walk away and I could come back, he would be like, okay, can you help me do this? Like he would be able to say, like your first request was too much. And then like sometimes I would forget and I would give like three directions and he can only handle one direction at a time. Mm -hmm. So even though like I have a million things on my mind and I'm just saying, do this. It, it doesn't work that way. And yeah. so um, yeah. it was a really good way for us to start working together and just for him to know adults have these problems too. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. So in my other line of work in radio, I had this boss that people would occasionally call up and be very angry <laughs> at something we said, something we did, some formatic, whatever. But people would, would call up and get angry. And his method of dealing with this was to not say a word, mm. was to literally just let them go. And he wouldn't respond, wouldn't say anything. And eventually they started, I guess, coming around, but they would start hearing themselves. And a lot of times how ridiculous they sounded. But they would calm down, and then a civil conversation could go from there. But that was always, and that's one of the things I learned from him, was to just not say anything yeah. and yeah. Yeah. quick to listen, yeah. slow to speak, yeah. slow to anger. Yeah. And the thing is, is that everybody always wants to defend themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have people who I was like, at first I was like, oh, he's obviously a freezer, but there are people who just listen because when you're angry, you know, parents always say, stop that. Or like quit being upset or, you know, quit crying. You can't. Yeah. yeah. Your body is yeah. giving you a signal, which you need to follow through on. Yep. And so when people are calm enough to just let somebody get the vent out and then say, well, this clearly affected you in a strong way. Let's, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that, you know, but when, when yeah. you know that you can, when yes. you know that that is part of your job, bosses are so lucky that way. Right. Um, then you can kind of say like, oh, well, here's what I'm going to do when this happens. And you, and you have to preempt yourself like that. You have to say, oh, when this happens, I'm going to do this. When this happens, I'm going to do this. And it doesn't start out perfect because obviously mm -hmm. when we were working with my son, we had a lot of trial and error. Yeah. But it comes around. Yeah. That was a really good strategy. Yeah. 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 For real. So um, you've used this term a few times, Kate. Uh, flip your lid. Uh, and, and, and I, I love that terminology. Um, but there's some resources that you've utilized and, and that's why maybe that terminology comes quickly to you. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit, uh, of those resources that you've been utilizing? Uh, so I, when I don't know something, I Google it like everybody else. And so, um, Dr. Dan Siegel's flipping the lid. You can rewatch this or you can rewatch his video. Cause I know that we're putting that up as a resource and I'm a book person. So I think the more that you um, can read with your kids, the better it is and books that are going through all of these emotions are important because one they tell you that it's normal two they tell you how the character in the story has fixed it and it just makes it a little bit more relatable to kids so um, one I go to my books and go to the doctors yeah <laughs> that's awesome uh, that's good. are there any other tools you guys have found are our, our go-to's um, for in, for just that, like, okay, you know, we talked about, like, the breathing exercise, um, or, but in a, in a heated moment, um, or, or even in, maybe not, maybe not an angry moment, maybe even a sadness moment, maybe a, in a moment of shame, uh, are there other go-tos you guys have found is, like, this is something that can help me slow down before I react and, and actually process what, what is happening? I think for me, I, you mentioned like taking a break. I think that for me, taking a break is a really wise thing that I, um, I don't send my kids to their room like punitively, but I'm like, you take a break in your room. I'm taking a break in my room when we're feeling a little bit calmer. 
let's meet up again and talk. And I think that those are things even like when we were like, we're married, so we have disagreements. Um, I think that there's a piece where we read in the Bible, like, don't let the sun go down when you're angry. But sometimes we're, um, I think they said it's the halt, like you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And sometimes we need to go to sleep. Like we need to rest. We can't resolve until we rest. But I think that principle is just, we're going to circle back and solve the problem when we're calm, when we are well fed, when we are well rested, when we are ready to, to do. And I think taking those breaks to me is what is really important because when we're flooded emotionally, um, you know, we can't, we're in that, we're in that flipped place. Then we can't calmly and rationally get it down. And I think sometimes as a parent too, I think, um, time about something with oppositional defiance disorder. Um, I did some work in my earlier years with kids and we talked about like just dropping the rope. Like if you're having a tug of war and an argument, like, you know how you win is you, you get out of the battle. Like you drop the rope. If you're tug- doing a tug of war and you drop the rope and walk away, the other person kind of lands on their booty, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they get a little bit we of consequences. We totally did that on purpose. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you get some consequences of your actions, which is a healthy thing. Like it's, it's a healthy thing that you said having that student pick up her things, that she had to be responsible for her reaction. Um, but we're not going to sit there and argue. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to argue with a four-year-old. Are you kidding me? Like, yeah. <laughs> they don't have the brain power to be in this argument. I'm like, what are we doing? We're not doing this. Like, right. we're going to step back. I, I love the story. Uh, this is a little bit, but I love the story of the disciples and Jesus are out on a boat and a storm comes and everyone's freaking out and they're looking for Jesus and Jesus is taking a nap Guys, none, never underestimate the value of a good, of a good nap. <laughs> Preach it. Preach it. He, Preach he, it. he like comes out. He's like, why are y'all freaking out? He yes. waves a hand. The yes. storm goes away. So when things are happening, never underestimate the value of a good nap. Good nap. Yeah. Awesome. You know, I will say this. Let me, let me throw this in here because I, I appreciate this. Just coming on board here, what I did at this at Revolution, um, you know, we... we do a mini series on emotional health and and being strong in that way, which is fantastic. It's something that we should be preaching. It's something we should be focused on. But we absolutely carry that over to the staff level, and it's it's so great to see that that we can have a discussion amongst the staff, and I can look at Nate and say I don't really agree with this. And not get mad and not get completely angry at each other and not like, you know, want to rip each other's head off. Like that, that's kind of the world I came from, you know, and, and it's been so great to have those, those healthy discussions and have those healthy resolutions to problems. It's been, it's been good, but it just, just, I guess just so it, you know, like we are actually, we try to practice this stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it does take work. It does. Yeah. It takes work. It does. So you were asking kind of um, like... How do you do it? I think it depends on who you're talking to and uh, what the issue is. And I would say, in a calm time, the one thing that we had done with my son, and I was like, listen, when you explode and you're screaming and you're throwing things and you're, and you're knocking stuff around, because he would become, he would just start to throw himself around. Um, and you would just steer clear. Um, I had said, you know, I don't, I don't know how to help you. I know that you're not listening to me at those points, but I, I can't help you. And he's like, mom, when I'm angry, wh- what I really want is for you to hug me. Yeah. And I was blown away because wow. it was like, how am I supposed to hug this kid who's flailing? And <laughs> sure. like, I'm, I have been hit many times in a rage, not intentionally. It just, it happens. And, um, so I was like, well, then we need to talk through this because you're screaming, you're yelling, you're angry. How do, how do I come give you a hug? And he's like, duh, put your arms out. (laughs) Well, you are right. (laughs) Why didn't I think about that? (laughs) And so that's what we did when I, and now I don't even wait for the explosion. When I can see that he's getting angry and kind of starting to flip around, I'll just hold my arms out. And I was like, this is what you asked me to do. And he'll just walk into it. Hmm. And, That's um, incredible. Scientifically, if you can hug through three deep breaths, yeah. you are regulated, and what you are doing, your slow breathing, is co-regulating the other person. Wow. So you can even do this with your spouses, 
right? When you're both kind of like whipped up or had a bad day, go give them a long hug through three deep breaths. Yeah. Yeah. And, but other people, like when my husband's angry, he would just rather be left alone. And the same with me. Like, if you see that I'm angry or I'm mad, please leave me alone. And I will come to you when I am calm and ready to talk to you. Yeah. And so I think you need to have that conversation with the people around you. Yeah. That's because it's going to work different at different times and different people. Yeah. We're all wired a little differently. But, but again, the idea that it's normal to have these, um, these feelings, it's normal to have these reactions even, but we can control them before they get, we're, we're not going to stop them from happening. That's not what control is but we can control how we respond. So yeah, great stuff. Well, we've got some more resources we're going to share uh, along these lines in our next episode, but I think that's probably a good stopping point for this one. So, uh, you know, thanks for, thanks for joining us again. Uh, again, this is the, the second of a three part episode. So if you haven't listened to the first episode uh, on anger specifically, go back and listen to it. It's a great one. Uh, and we'll see you next time uh, right here on the round table. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Revolution Roundtable. If you enjoyed this conversation, we'd love it if you'd consider sharing this podcast with a friend or leave a review where you listen to your podcast. We'd also love to connect with you. Visit us at revolutioncc.org slash roundtable and let us know what you thought of the episode. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.